Welcome to the car, guys. And this week, a freaking Lexus LFA. <laughs> <laughs> Holy mother of all things that are great. Look at this bad boy in the most gorgeous silky black color. Oh, it's so oh. deep, isn't it? It's like oh. squid ink. We are very, very lucky boys. Oh, 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 oh. oh my goodness. This, my friends, is a hand-built million pound Japanese supercar. It can do over 200 miles an hour. And this week on The Car Guys, we're going to tell you all about it. Yes, we are. Before planning to drive this car, I never actually knew the history of the Lexus LFA, but it is truly fascinating, tinged with tragedy, and it really is the story of three men. Haruhiko Tanahashi, Hiromo Norozi, and Akio Tioda. It was October 2000, and a small, talented breakaway team at Lexus, led by chief engineer Haruko Tanahashi, began work on a secret project. Up until then, Lexus was known for making luxurious Luxo Barge saloons. Nothing sporty, nothing exciting. You may recognize the name Tanahashi because he was also responsible for the Celica GT4 and was well respected at Toyota. During a test session at the Shibitsu Proving Ground. How'd you say it? <laughs> she Shibetsu yep, Proving Ground, Tanahashi confided in chief test driver Hirumu Narusa and the two discussed a new supercar and they agreed on a mid front engine car. Yes, they did. But how to get the project approved for the board. Well, it just so happened that Nuruse was a racing instructor for a certain Akio Toyoda. Very handy. Who, despite not being a senior employee at Toyota, was of course a member of the founding family, which probably gave him more sway than others. Yeah, no shit. No shit. Toyota made impassioned presentations to the Lexus board, which was initially rejected due to exorbitant costs of making a wholly bespoke performance car. But finally, in front of a gathering of 100 executives, Project P280, as it was known, was approved. Tanahashi was therefore given free reign to create a car that pushes the boundaries of motorsports engineering to create a halo product, a flagship supercar for Lexus. They got to work and not even their fellow engineers knew what they were doing. It was a true secret skunk walks. Skunky skunk work. <laughs> skunky, skunk face. Skunky, skunky, skunky. <laughs> It was a true secret skunk works project. Now, five years later, on the 10th of January 2005, at the North American International Auto Show in Detroit, under the banner of Luxury Lightning Strikes. Luxury Lightning Strikes. The normal conservative comfortable Lexus shocked the world. A 500 brake horsepower, 200 mile an hour coupe that was a fundamental shift in the company strategy and ushered in a new design language Lexus called El Finesse. What it called the LFA concept. LFA stood for Lexus Future Advance. Though it was reportedly changed to the quite horrible Lexus F Sports Apex for the production model. Ugh. And then nothing. Two years later, in 2007, the LFA suddenly reappeared at the Geneva Motor Show with a 5-litre V10 engine, limited production, and it took another year for the LFA to be revealed to the UK, which is where I first saw it. And what's this? A little-known roaster concept announced in 2008 and then quietly mothballed. In fact, Lexus only made one actual LFA Spider in the real world. A shame, really. Imagine a V10 screaming engine right behind your ear in an open-top car. Oh, it'd be glorious. Oh, it'd be amazing. Unbelievable. Finally, in October 2009, nine years after work began, and just as Akio Toyoda was made president of Toyota, the Lexus LFA, note no dash or hyphen, was officially announced for a limited production of just 500 cars to be built at the rate of one a day. Priced at $336,000 or £343,000, a crazy sky high price, even compared to Porsches and Ferraris of the time, but Lexus still lost money on every single one. Just like the GR Yaris. Just like the GR Yaris. The first car rolled off the production line at the Motomachi plant on the 15th of December 2010 under the gaze of a proud Akio Toyoda, 150 team members, and Lexus ambassador and former Miss Universe, Rio Mori. 
but one person not present was Hiromo Narusu, who had been tragically killed six months before leaving the Nürburgring. Production ended on the 14th of December 2012 with the last of 50 Nürburgring editions. The Nürburgring editions had larger carbon front splitters, wheels, slightly more power, and most obviously a flipping great carbon fiber rear spoiler. It was so adept at traversing the ring that it broke the lap record for a production car with a time of just seven minutes, 14 seconds. Now Ruzu would have been very proud. This is the last ever car made, and this is the actual event marking the end of production attended fittingly by Toyota himself. And how about this for a cool story? Before production of the LFA began in 2009, the team wanted to test its performance and abilities at the Nürburgring 24 hours, so they entered two prototypes under the name of, wait for it, Gazoo Racing. Mm. Who hasn't heard of them now, eh? That's where Toyota's famous motorsport division came from. And I'm not finished yet, because in a turn of events worthy of a major Hollywood film, one of the drivers using the alias of Maurizio Kinoshita was actually Akio Toyota himself. Amazing. In complete secrecy, of course, because otherwise the Toyota board would have blocked it. Honestly, how cool is this dude. In total, 550 LFAs were produced, but it was always an acquired taste and acquired by a strange selection of people. Oh sure, there were the racing team bosses and the odd rock star, but also remember that Paris Hilton famously had one and drove it for quite a long time. Very odd choice. Very strange. And who could forget the LFA is one of Jeremy Clarkson's favorite cars. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we are gonna drive this car for the very first time for your viewing pleasure. And of course, for our pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, quite a lot of our pleasure. <laughs> yeah, actually. mostly our pleasure. Yes. Yeah. So, Jason, come yes. on then. Tell me what you like about the exterior of this wonderful LFA. Because this car is in black, it really accentuates all of the curves and the, and the simpleness of the shape. The F on the front wing here, do you know what that stands for? Flip, that's fast. <laughs> Actually stands for flagship, because this, this was the flagship car oh, of Lexus. Oh, okay, yeah. really? And flagship actually denotes that it sits outside of the normal engineering and development processes at Lexus. So therefore, it, this makes it very clearly a special project car. Yeah, I think to be fair, looking at it and comparing it with every other Lexus that I've ever seen in my life probably denotes it as a special car outside it's of quite, that. It's quite special. Well, the door mirrors are very weird on this car. They kind of stick out and they don't feel like they're part of the original shape. You'd expect them to be a bit further down the wing. Another interesting aerodynamic feature is the little raised winglets on the side of these wing mirrors, obviously channeling the air all the way back down here. In its resting mode, we don't have any spoilers at all here. We've got this little flip up at the end, but nothing that would denote this as being some sort of amazing 200 miles an hour supercar, which is quite incredible. There's not many cars that will do 200 miles an hour that aren't festooned with massive spoilers on the back to try and keep the things on the road. This rear wing is active and includes gurney flaps on each edge. Above 50 miles an hour, it rises to improve high-speed stability. The Nürburgring edition has a fixed, even larger wing. Another iconic LFA attribute is our three exhaust pipes down here. I mean, just look at this, that in itself, and they're still warm from when it went out earlier. Oh, lovely, lovely warm. In order to save weight and to improve crash protection, the LFA was switched from aluminium to advanced carbon fiber reinforced plastic for the chassis and the bodywork. This saves hundreds of kilograms and it makes it exceptionally stiff. Part of the reason for the 10-year gestation period is that the Lexus had to actually learn to perfect the production of its own carbon fibre at the Motomachi factory, something it had never done before. This meant developing new carbon fibre looms and a laser system to measure its integrity, and also a whole new way of creating the material. As you would expect on a car like this, carbon ceramic brakes are standard and they help the LFA stop as quick as it goes. And just check out the size of the ducts on the front of the car and the rear just to help cool those brake discs down. So if you have to go on a long trip in this car and you want to take a little bag or sack of accoutrements with you, uh, we have some space in here. It's actually not that bad. Uh, we've got a nice little funny torno cover. Hurt my finger. So look, there you go. It's not bad, you could get an overnight bag in there, couldn't you? We've got a toolbox behind this one. We've got battery behind this one. This is not brilliant, but it's as, as much as you get in most supercars. Here we are then inside the cabin of the Lexus LFA. And I have to say, this feels 
hand built it feels exceptional quality everything is so tactile and beautiful and sculpted and oh you just want to touch everything i have to say and i don't mean to do the italians down in any way shape or form but this is what you would expect for a 300,000 pound car right every single piece of stitching in here is precision perfect all the materials are wonderful. The bronzed sheen on these aluminium parts of the car is, yeah. it's not sumptuous, but it's its exact. And look at this gloss carbon fiber yeah. all the way around the cabin. This one's got a red and black interior, but it's not like a bright garish red. It's like a darker, more classy red. Oh, the steering wheel is, I mean, there's no other way of saying it. I mean, it's perfect. It's absolutely yeah. perfect size the way it holds this is proper howard hughes stuff this <laughs> loving it we've got these paddles of course just sculpted perfection look just look oh, that how cold delicate cold. yeah little indicators and little wipers are just this beautiful piece which sticks out. It's unlike anything else. The seats are grippy and, and cosseting and, and oh. lovely. They're comfortable at the same time. Carbon fibre frame seats with eight-way adjustment now. And look at this as well. The centre of the console, you've got obviously normal controls that you would expect. Heated mm. screens and things, rear screen, got your air circ. But then also you've got this fabulous mousy remote control yeah, system here. Weird. This is so you can navigate all of the crazy, in this car, Japanese menus. These buttons oh. here are for more toggles to do with the screen so you can quickly flip oh, between so menus. So it is like a whole mouse thing going on here. Yep. Left and right click. You can see the vents are just you know, beautifully incorporated into mm. the dash. We've got a glove box down here, which you flick open, presumably by pressing Pushing that. that button. And inside we've got a Frank Sinatra well, CD. But more importantly, Yep, the obligatory Japanese flare. Amazing. Yep. Absolutely you amazing. You break down, you've got a wave of flare in Japan. And, oh, is that a tyre pressure? tyre pressure gauge oh, with its wonderful. own special little holder. Look at the door handles as well. Oh, these are amazing. Look Again, at that. Completely bespoke, little tiny slender things. They don't feel like they're ever going to break. And then you've got a little bit of a, of a sort of shelf here yeah. to put things on, which is sort of useful. You can put some things, I was going to say you can put some things behind the seats, but you definitely can't. No, there's and no you'll, room. You'll notice that apart from the glove box and these tiny little bins in the doors, there's no other storage in this cabin. So the only thing you can really take with you is a pack of opal fruits. Let's have a look at this thing. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, I don't think you are ready. I am ready. Okay, let's go. Ooh. 0 to 60 comes in 3.7 <laughs> seconds. It's got 552 brake horsepower. That's 560 PS. And it goes on to a top speed of 202 miles an hour. This, my friends, is one of the all-time great engines. The screaming light speed unit known as the 1LR GUE. Sexy. A 4.8 litre V10 with a 9,000 RPM red line that takes a sixth of a second to rev from zero to that red line, which is why it holds the record for the fastest revving production engine. This little thing delivers 354 pounds feet of torque, which is 480 Newton meters. Power is driven through the rear wheels via a bespoke rear mounted six speed automatic sequential gearbox. Easy for you to say. This bad boy weighs in at 1,640 kilograms. And it's hand built by Lexus LFA Works. Look at that, just look at it. Well, I am distracted slightly by mm -hmm. the absolute gorgeous carbon fiber on the underside of this bonnet. And just look at this, a carbon fiber engine strut. Amazing. See? You stick it down here in this little perfectly crafted piece of aluminium, and then it goes back up in there Ta da Managed to hold it up. But yeah, what a work of art this is. Uh, it, this is just, the engineering in here is so incredibly precise. So they have a, a strut brace across the front of the car in beautiful carbon. None of your massive Mark II Escort bars that go across from your Max Power magazines. This is very small, it's very subtle, it does the job it's designed to do and nothing else. Gorgeous, isn't it? Absolutely stunning. So do you want an interesting fact about this particular engine? Yes, I do. It was never supposed to be a V10. What? It was never on the cards. Surely, a no. V10 is as SNC no, is LFA itself. No, it is now. Oh. It absolutely is synonymous with LFA. Mm. However, in the original concept of this car was supposed to be a V8. Was it? Yeah, but it took so long to get it from 
thought and paper into full production that by that time all the F1 cars were running V10 engines and Toyota were like, we know what we've got in the cupboard. Aha. Aha. Therefore, V10. Good, and I'm very glad they did. Me too. And now I can hear you screaming at us uh, from your lounges and your cinema rooms. Car guys, why don't you just drive the damn thing? That's what true. What a good idea. Well, you stay in your cave <laughs> and we'll get on with it. Okay, here we are then. Yeah. This is it. We're going to drive this thing. I know. I am. Right? I'm tingling with excitement. Mm. I have to be honest. <laughs> How cool is that? So it's a mechanical ring that actually moves, but then with digital displays in it. I'm loving that work. Totally unnecessary. Uh, completely. But the, ultimately the coolest thing you've seen today. Right, so here we go then. So I yeah. assume uh, we've got an engine start button. So I'm going to put my foot on the brake and I'm going to press that. <laughs> Whatever she said, I totally agree. Okay, with we're in drive. You do have to manually take off the handbrake, it doesn't do it for you. So, fortunately, I know that it's down here somewhere. There we go. So, both paddles together to make neutral. Right. And you have to actually put it in neutral before you can do reverse. And reverse is this little button. Oh, over it here. is that little button that's got a little R on it. Oh, yeah. interesting. It's a bit odd, isn't it? I love the quirkiness of this car because, of course, like the modern Lexuses and, of course, like the Honda NSX, you've got big chunky controls up here which are used for the headlights and for the different driving modes. Almost like little ears. Now this is obviously an early-ish paddle shift so yep. it's not the smoothest. Single clutch. You sort of have to lift off gently when you make the changes just like you do with the Challenge Darling. Oh okay. And is it uh, permanently manual or is it uh, is there auto it's function auto as, as well? well. Yep. Oh, okay good. <laughs> you can sort of tell oh. what's going to happen, can't you? This is, um, mm, yes, delicious. It, it's yes, worse. yes, I am, uh, I am fizzy. Now you're right. It feels incredibly well damped. These are, it's on. This one's just come from Japan, and it's got old tyres on it, so these are going to be refreshed, which means they're slightly harder than you'd expect, and it's going to give you a bit more tyre roar than you normally would have as well. But uh, we'll forgive it that because it's a Lexus LFA, and we're allowed to drive it. supposed to be. All it's saying in Japanese is, you're not in Osaka. <laughs> yes. Whilst driving at 200 miles an hour, Lexus is expecting you to uh, diligently use your little finger to control a mouse to select one of these many different controls. I would file that under exceptionally dangerous. Oh dear. badge in between the seats here. Does that denote the number? 
of the production of this car? I guess it must do, out of the 550. Nice. What's, what number is it? Well, I don't know, my eyesight's too bad to be able to see it. 113? It is 113, yes. If we go back past the entrance, the uh, the road to Octane. Yeah. Is that, oh yeah, look at that. Oh, he's actually, uh, push it. Uh, back to neutral. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, so what do we learn from that? We learned that it's quite hard to reverse in this car, <laughs> especially if you're on a tight road and this car's coming and towards you. Yeah. I mean, it was a bit of flapping. Yeah, it was a bit I'm of flapping, yeah, there was. Uh, but what we've learned here is that not only do you have to go into neutral to go into reverse, to go into reverse, but to get out of reverse again, you've got to do it. You need to neutral well. first and then before you can flip up, but yes. Right, well, um, mm. Should we give it some beanage? I think I think when we get to a road that's is that straight? I think that's straight. Yeah. Okay, here we go. A bit then. of beanage. Mind the tyres are old. Yeah. So some beans here in the yeah. Lexus elevator. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. on a supercar, wow. do I buy an LFA or a Carrera GT? Oh, now, now we're talking. Right, because they're roughly the same sort of money-ish. Yep. This is a much, much better car. <laughs> I mean, my vote would be with this. I know the Porsche is special but, for some people, but for me, this is, this is the one. Okay, so can I just say why I think it's more special? But of course you can. You're amongst friends here, Jason. Right, good. Can, can we talk? Can we talk? The damping in this is is far superior to the Carrera GT. That's true. This feels very compliant on the road. The engine sounds much, much better. It does. It does. As if to prove the points. Oh. Goodness me, what are you doing? Yes. Yes. Wrap it and have it walked to my room. Oh my God, I mean a million pounds is a lot of money. I wouldn't hesitate. If I had a million pound in the bank, I would be offering Lucas money right now. Oh, 
tractor. Tractor. Big tractor. Oh yeah. that I've driven and been in and, I, and we've been in some crazy, crazy stuff. Oh, that's some traction control there. Time for you to experience some LFA action. I'm very, um, very nervous. Good, good. Um, nervous is good. So obviously I will be very circumspect in my acceleration. And that was maybe a quarter throttle. <laughs> <laughs> the front end is very responsive considering there's a bloody great big V10 sitting. You know? well, I think that's the whole uh, mid front layout. So I mean, it is quite far back, like you said earlier. Uh, and that's all going to be designed for motorsport, isn't it? It's all going to be part of their testing at the Nürburgring. It's a very, very nice thing to drive. It's very direct. You don't need a lot of steering input. It's quite McLaren in its ability to change direction mid-corner. The visibility is pretty decent. Mm -hmm. I can actually see out the back using the rear view mirror, which was a bit of a surprise to me, really, because I wasn't expecting that. Brakes are nice and firm. Yep. Carbon. Key. There's a lot of confidence actually I think we were hurtling along back there that was they felt good how fast the downshifts are Yeah, that's true. I don't yeah. like that. Yeah. 
even at 700,000, which they have been for a while, that's a, still a chunk of change, it's really. A massive chunk of money. I struggle to co come up with a concept of spending a million pounds on a Lexus, but amongst car people, amongst you guys, I mean, this is one of the ultimate coolest cars ever. And at our age, we're not really there. We're not really about impressing ladies as we drive by. That's not what we're about. It's well, that's we actually like impressing ge older gentlemen. Yeah, because we are because we know at our age that, that this type of thing doesn't impress the ladies. Yeah. So you're wasting your efforts. At our age, you've got to hit it with nettles. <laughs> Literally, this is my type of supercar. It's understated. It's under the radar. Yet. Yeah. Will do 200 miles an hour. It has all the power and handling and everything that you could possibly want. If you want to be the coolest cat in the garage or at a, a car meet, this this is what gets you entrance to the super cool club. And with that, we're back at the Octane Collection. There seems to be a Ferrari F50 ahead of us. Oh yes, there is. Do you yes. think they'll throw us the keys to that if we're very nice? To them? Oh, I don't see why not. We haven't damaged this one, have we? Mm. Excellent plan. Well, thank you very much for watching this episode on the Lexus LFA. Hope you enjoyed it. This was one of the greatest life experiences I think I have ever, ever had. Mm. Now, don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of this kind of shizzle. Ding that notification bell for when we have another film uploaded. Find us on Instagram and you know where the merch is. And there'll be another episode of The Car Guys, hopefully next week. <laughs> <laughs>